Okay, good morning once again. If you will, open your Bible to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua. I have titled our message, uh, our study this morning, The Secret to Victory, Faith, Courage, and Obedience. The Secret to Victory, Faith, Courage, and Obedience. Joshua chapter 1. And we will begin reading our text. Uh, we're continuing our survey of the Bible, and we're currently in the book of Joshua. The secret to victory, faith, courage, and obedience. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm going to give them to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your feet, foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittite, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their father to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall de not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So this new generation of Israelite had been instructed in the law and ways of God through Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. They're now ready to enter uh, the promised land of Canaan. And God raised up this new leader, Joshua, a man of courage, a man of faith, to continue his plan. And what is that? His plan is to give the people the promised land. So Joshua would lead the people on a campaign to first central, then southern, and then the northern part of Canaan, Israel and her leader is to be thorough in driving out the sinful nation of Canaan. Now, it's very important for us to look at Numbers 33, and then we'll come back here, verse 51 and 56, because God's instruction is that when you go into the land, your task is to thoroughly drive out and destroy all the Canaanites in the land. Joshua Taz was to destroy all the kings. And then once the tribes go in and take possession of their inheritance, their land, they are to finish off the Canaanites in the land. In Numbers uh, 33, verse 51 through 56, we see God's instruction about what they are to do once they enter the land. Can I get a volunteer to read verse 51 through 56? Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, just the right spot. Uh -huh. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their figured stones, and destroy all their molten images, and demolish all their idols. And you shall take possession of the land and live in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it. You shall inherit the land by lot according to your families. To the larger, you should give more inheritance, and to the smaller, you shall give less inheritance. Wherever the lot falls to anyone, that shall be his. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides. And they shall trouble you in the land in which you live. 
It shall come about that as I plan to do to them, so I will do to you. Amen. So here we see God's instructions that once you guys get into the land, I want you to thoroughly drive out all the Canaanites in the land. And we're going to see that their disobedience to this instruction is going to lead to a lot of problems in Israel history in the future. However, Joshua will prepare for the conquest of the land. In chapter one through five, we see Joshua preparing for the conquest. But I want us to look at God's encouragement here in verse one through uh, nine, God's encouragement to Joshua. And here in this encouragement in verse one through nine, God is guaranteeing Joshua that his presence will always be with him and that he will bless him. And he's saying in verse six, be strong and courageous for you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their father to give them. See, whenever God commands you to do something, he always provides the means by which you can do it. And the means by which um, uh, Joshua can be strong and courageous is the knowledge he have of God's attributes or God's character and also the knowledge he have of the promises of God. The promises of God is how Joshua is able to be strong and courageous. The promise of God is gonna give Joshua the confidence. And what is confidence? Confidence is a state of absolute certainty and assurance. Confidence is a state of absolute certainty and assurance. And remember, Joshua have already been tried. His confidence have already been developed. And therefore, this confidence is how he's able to be strong and courageous. Confidence is also hope. Hope is when you expect what God has promised with complete certainty, absolute certainty, without any doubt. In circumstances, God promises, give the believer the confidence and the courage that he need before man. God promised to be with Joshua and to give him great success. And this promise should give him absolute certainty and assurance that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. Joshua's faith is to be directed. See, a person's faith is only as strong as the object of his faith. And what is the object of Joshua's faith? His, the object of his faith should always be directed toward the promises of God. Because when his, the object of his faith is directed toward the promise of God, what is the result? He have inner happiness. He have inner happiness. Inner tranquility of soul or uh, our inner peace or joy and the blessing of victory. And see, the secret to having inner happiness is actually confidence, absolute certainty that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And so this is how we have complete inner happiness or tranquility of soul and a relaxed mental attitude or a stable mental attitude. And speaking of the happiness of God, the happiness of God is that inner contentment and joy that the believer have in all circumstances because if God is for us, who can be against us? That is inner happiness. See, obedience to God would be an expression of Joshua's courage and his faith. So when he obeyed God, and go up and take the land with complete certainty that God is going to do what he said he's going to do and also have the power and the ability to do what he says he's going to do. His obedience is actually an expression of his courage and faith in God. See, apart from faith, no one can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. So apart from believing that to be true, no person can have salvation or eternal life. Well, that same faith that we use 
to get saved is the same faith that we need in order to experience the happiness of God in life. In other words, the object of an unbeliever's faith must be in the truthfulness of the gospel concerning Jesus Christ and the, or the promise of God concerning Jesus Christ. If you believe, you will be saved. And so same thing, in order to have happiness, then the object of our faith must always be in the promises of God in order to have inner happiness. See, the faith we experience toward the, uh, we express toward the truth of the gospel concerning Jesus Christ of salvation is the same faith in the Christian life that gives us the happiness of God in spite of the circumstances, in spite of all the odds being up against us. So one of uh, the things I wanted to uh, help uh, you this morning by looking at God's promise to Joshua and how to have mental stability in a crisis. How to have mental stability in a crisis. See, the Christian life is just full of crises. You know, you can't listen to some pastor who make you think that the Christian life is going to be crisis free. Well, there's no such thing. You're either coming out of a crisis, you're either uh, about to go into a crisis, uh, you're either coming out or you're going in, or you're in a crisis or you're about to go into a crisis. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, we all should have mental stability in a crisis. We as believers are to think and apply truth to the crisis. We're not to respond to the crisis in our emotion. And God gives a secret here through encouraging Joshua to have a mental stability in the midst of a crisis when it comes. And so I want to give you a few steps to have a mental stability when a crisis comes, because a crisis is coming. And, and I don't, I'm not a prophet, but I remember uh, giving a lesson similar to this in the prison, and, and, and I mentioned something about I may leave here today and may have this type of crisis. And guess what happened? <laughs> when I left, I had that exact crisis to come. Now I got to apply all the truth that I just presented to these inmates. <laughs> and so I had to apply. And so I want to give you some steps to have a mental stability in a crisis instead of being miserable in a crisis. Step one to have a mental stability in a crisis is recall to your mind a promise that God have made you as a believer in Jesus Christ in the word of God. But here's the deal. If you have not disciplined yourself on a regular basis to make learning the word of God a priority, you will fail that crisis test. Because the only way you can know the promises of God that reveal the plan of God for your life that gives you hope is you got to be consistently taking in the word of God. You have to be positive because the first step to having mental, mental stability in a crisis is recalling to your mind a promise from God. An example of that, go to Isaiah 41 verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Here we see a promise to believers. Do not fear. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not fear. Anciently look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So here we see the command to not fear, to place the problem in the hands of the Lord, because the battle is the Lord. We are not to fear or be afraid when the crisis happened. So in other words, when a crisis happened or come in my life, I'm to recall to my mind this promise. Do not fear, for I am with you. Two, the second step to have a mental stability in a crisis 
is to apply faith. Apply faith. Accept what God has said as true, apart from intellectual proof. Some people say, I'm not going to believe that what God has said is true. He got to show me something. Well, that is not faith. Faith is God said it. I believe what he has said and promised. And in his time, even though I don't see it now, I will see what he has promised. So faith believe without seeing proof that God will fulfill his promise. So I take God at his word. I believe the truth of God's word. If you don't believe the truth of God's word, you would not have mental stability in a crisis. And then third, now you must apply the doctrines that you have accumulated from the word of God to that particular crisis. Now it's time to apply the doctrine to the crisis. What I mean by that? Well, there is two doctrines that you have to apply. One is the doctrine of who God is. The doctrine of who God is. As we study the word of God, God revealed more and more about himself, more and more about his character. And guess what we have to do in the crisis? We have to apply that knowledge to that crisis in order to have mental stability and not lose our minds. What I mean by the, the knowledge of the doctrine of God, for example, sovereignty. The word of God reveals, go to Deuteronomy 4.39. In Deuteronomy 4.39, the word of God revealed that God is sovereign. He is the supreme ruler of the universe. He has absolute authority over all things. He brought about all things into being and allowed them to be. Therefore, he's the head muncho in charge. He is sovereign over all things. Deuteronomy 439, someone please. Know therefore today and take it to your heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. Amen. Isaiah 46, 10. <clears throat> Isaiah 46, 10. Forty six ten read. Well, look at verse uh, nine. Remember the former thing long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient time, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So, in other words, here, what God is saying here, I am the sovereign creator. I declare well, what will happen or be allowed to happen in time and whatever is allowed to happen in time all serve my purpose. And so in other words, I am in control even when things seem like it is out of control. So I have to apply that knowledge to that experience that God is in sovereign control. Whatever happened, he allowed it to happen is all under his sovereign control so I can relax. So I have to apply that understanding. See, I can read this, but it ain't going to do me any good. It's not going to pr produce inner happiness in my life if I don't apply it to that particular situation. And then another, uh, uh, another thing, uh, the Bible teaches me about the love of God. The love of God says that, uh, that he personally loves me. He's always seeking what is best for me. And his love do not damage for me through changing circumstances or my failures. So even though I may fail, God love for me never fail. His love never damaged. So I have to apply that to that situation and say, God personally loved me. Therefore, he's going to meet my needs in this situation because he loves me personally, because I'm his child. The knowledge that God knows everything, he sees everything. The knowledge that God is all powerful. His Power is not limited by circumstance. These are the, 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 the things that I have to think about and apply to the crisis in order to have mental stability and inner happiness. God is truth. 
and he cannot lie. In other words, he is obligated to do what he has promised. So this is how you have inner happiness, applying the doctrine of who God is. And then second, applying the doctrine of the plan of God for your life. In other words, the promises of God reveal the plan of God for your life. So I have to apply the doctrine of understanding God's plan for my life revealed through the promises to that crisis. And you know what? Now I'm able to sleep like a baby because I have inner peace now. Instead of my emotion controlling and enslaving me to the circumstance through fear and worry and anxiety, now I have peace. I have victory over my circumstance because I am applying the doctrines of the word of God to the crisis. That's why it's so important. I know you hear every Sunday the importance of making, learning, thinking, believing, applying the word apart. That's why it is so important because there's no way we can have mental stability in a crisis apart from learning the word of God. And then fourth and lastly, now is time to make a decision. Reach a conclusion. In other words, confidence to make sound decisions. So now I have the confidence I need to make the right decision in the midst of this particular crisis. Without it, I don't have what I need to make the right decision in the crisis. So the secret in possessing the land is Joshua must have as the object of his faith, the promises of God, which produces courage toward man, which is expressed through his obedience. So after encouragement from God, Joshua commanded the people to get ready. And then he sent two spies into the Jericho to view the situation. And now he have complete courage. He have complete certainty and inner happiness to do what God say, uh, told him to do. When we come back uh, next week, we'll begin to look at another woman who demonstrated faith in the object, and that is Rahab. And so we'll start right here. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back um, after the break. Thank mm -hmm. you. 